Okay. Thank you all for coming out and supporting APNEAP Worldwide and the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Okay, I will use my New York voice. Can you hear me? Okay. Can the mic fix it? Gloria is in the house. Attention must be paid. Okay. Extraordinary women. So I'm going to start now anyway and pray that the mics will work by the time our next speaker comes. So it's working now? Okay, good. Excellency, sisters, brothers, welcome. Um, we're so delighted to see so many people supporting voices of victims of human trafficking, readings from rivers of flesh, and other stories. Every bit intimidating as any brothel owner. That is how Pulitzer Prize winning um, <clears throat> New York Times columnist and author Nicholas Kristof describes the person who made today's event possible, and that is the indomitable Rashira Gupta. Um, in addition to founding APNE app, Women Worldwide. She's done so many things, and I'll hopefully have the opportunity to tell you more about that, as will she later on. But about River of Flesh first, it, it brings together 21 stories about trafficked and prostituted women by some of India's most celebrated writers. So when Rashir proposed that today's event be part of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime Artists United Against Human Trafficking Initiative, we were so honored to partner with her once again. Art is a powerful advocacy tool to raise awareness, and we have always used art to complement our work. We hope the stories in Rivers of Flesh will move people to take action against the scourge of sex trafficking, including by supporting the UN Voluntary Trust Fund for victims of trafficking in persons, especially women and children, established by the General Assembly in 2010 as part of the UN Global Plan of Action to Combat Trafficking in Persons. That money goes to NGOs who are doing the work that we really need to be done on the ground in terms of reintegrating survivors, in terms of listening to their voices, in terms of providing them legal and medical and employment opportunities. So please, let's get the word about that trust fund out here today. And if you're inspired by what you hear today, make sure that trust fund is adequately funded. The first time I read about sex trafficking, we didn't have the word trafficking, we didn't have it as a crime, we didn't have a convention to cover it, but we knew it was going on. And how did I as a 15-year-old Iranian-American girl living in New York, um, learn about that for the first time. And uh, uh, that was because of Gloria Steinem. And it was in her book, Outrageous Acts and Everyday Rebellions. Where is my bag? I still have the copy from when I was 15 years old here, and I want to take it out today. Um, it's the big one over there. But we can look at that later. But um, it was in that book that I learned about sex trafficking. And unfortunately, so many other afraid, still have it, um, so many other scourges that it, it's, it's sad that we're still working on these issues in the UN today. I, I wish this book wasn't as relevant as it is today, but unfortunately, it remains so. And so our work continues. Um, that book influenced me to make a change in my life and influenced me to take the course of action that I could and, and, and taught me that rebellion could be used in a positive direction. I was a 15-year-old high school dropout, and I learned that rebellion was a good thing. Um, I saw on, on uh, PBS on uh, Finding Your Roots that you didn't know, Gloria, that your grandmother was a rebel because women's stories often passed down generation by generation don't include the part of badass troublemakers. Um, but that's an important part. UN, get ready. Um, so our first, today we will hear um, from nine women um, from different <coughs> walks of life, but all of them very committed to this cause. Um, we hope that the indelible mark Gloria's book made on me, Rushira's book will make on all of you. Um, I don't see how it could not. Uh, there's a book signing afterwards. I hope that you come out after to the bookshop downstairs and support that as well. Um, first offense of a moderator, not shutting off your own phone. Um, but um, we will also hear from today survivors, survivor leaders like T. Ortiz Pettigrew and Samia Suleiman, a 15-year-old sexual um, survivor of sexual enslavement at the hands of ISIL. Samia, we are so honored to have you here today. If only any of us were as courageous of, as you at the age of 15, that you can come here and tell your story. Um, 
and also Rachel. And survivors like Rachel Moran, who's also here today, thank you so much for coming and being a leader on these issues. But first, our, we'll also hear from artists, we'll hear from ambassadors. When I first came to UN headquarters like 11 years ago, we didn't have this many women ambassadors. We still don't have enough, but it's such a pleasure to be able to go to work every day with ambassadors like the ambassador of Hungary and the ambassador um, <coughs> here of Panama, Panama sorry, Panama, um, who has been fantastic on these issues, and, um, and the artists who are here today and the activists who are here today. But first, our <coughs> keynote and opening speaker, Gloria Steinem. Okay, she needs no introduction, but for those of you who somehow don't know, now you'll know. Um, writer, lecturer, editor, feminist ac activist, recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, um, the highest award that President Obama can bestow upon anyone. In 1972, she co-founded Miss Magazine. She's also one of the co-founders of New York Magazine. Her books include the bestsellers Revolution from Within, Outrageous Acts and Everyday Rebellions, Moving Beyond Words, and Marilyn. Um, her latest book, released in 2015, paperback copy to come out soon with a updated chapter on sex trafficking, I understand, um, will be, is titled, entitled My Life on the Road, um, and it's a book about more than 30 years of uh, being on the road as a feminist organizer. And I would also tell you two or three other things about her. You know, um, Gloria graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Smith College in 1956 and then spent two years in India on a Chester Bowles Fellowship. She wrote for Indian publications and was influenced by Gandhian activism. She has been the subject of three biographical documentaries, including HBO's Gloria in her own words. Gloria, it's such an honor to have you here today. The floor is yours. I think it's good to be in this room because we have just a hint of a circle here. So true, we have the hierarchical setup back there, you know, which means we're looking at each other's backs and I'm looking at you and Hierarchy is based on patriarchy, and patriarchy doesn't work anywhere anymore. <laughs> but we have, <laughs> but these seats are a little, we have a hint of a circle, so I hope that we can uh, feel as if we are in a circle and understand that each of us has some part of the knowledge, the solution, the insight, the understanding that will contribute to the whole and we need, we need our circle. Uh, I just want to remind you, first of all, that this is not a women's issue, hello. <laughs> this is not a children's issue. This is a world issue. Uh, I, I have been sh shamelessly uh, exploiting the great scholarship in a book called Sex and World Peace, which I recommend to you, Sex and World Peace. Uh, because they, the scholars, and it's actually readable, though it's scholarly, <laughs> have, <laughs> have looked at absolutely every current country and determined, proved, that the single most important element or determinant of whether a country is violent within itself or whether it will be willing to use military violence against another country is not poverty, not access to natural resources, not religion, or even degree of democracy, it's violence towards females. Not because female life is any more important than male life, but because it is what happens first. The, the patriarchal systems that came into this earth in the last 5% of human history, it's important to understand they weren't always there, <laughs> um, it, Control, the, the basis of it is controlling reproduction. And you can't control another adult, a human being without violence. So it is really very organically built into these structures. And we may see it even in our homes, dominance if not violence. Uh, we get the idea that it's okay for one group to dominate another and that also creates a place for racism, for caste, for class, 
because we have been convinced that that's possible. So uh, violence against females is basic in that way, and right now it has reached a point <laughs> where for the first time there are fewer females on earth than males because of all the forms of violence cumulatively, whether it is sexualized violence in war zones, sex trafficking, which is obviously, we all know is bigger than ever before, uh, preference for sons, which has created a daughter deficit and a son surplus in so many parts of the world, uh, female genital mutilation, domestic violence in this country, in my country, which is enormous, you know, it's murdered more women by, by their husbands and boyfriends than have ever been uh, killed in any terrorist event and, and also in the last three wars. I mean, so, you know, it, I just want to say that it really is basic and not to allow ourselves to get shunted off into some compartment as if, uh, oh, that's over there. No, this is, must be part of every country's foreign policy. The easiest way to figure out how democratic and peaceful any group is, is to see are there women there and how are they being treated? And that should be uh, a measure in all of our foreign policies. Um, and I think we must remember how basic it is in another way, because it really is all about controlling the means of reproduction. If women did not have wombs, we'd be fine. <laughs> um, and racism and caste make it much worse, of course, because then you have to control reproduction in order to perpetuate those divisions in the long run. So they are really inextricably intertwined, and there's no way of changing the status of women without fighting racism, not only because uh, women are members, half of every racial group, but also because racism itself is, depending, uh, is dependent on controlling uh, reproduction. So this has caused this depth of, of the political system. You know, they call, people say, there's a difference between culture and politics. I think actually what happens to men is political, what happens to women is cultural. Sure. But it's all political, <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all actually uh, about power. And because of this emphasis on controlling reproduction, some women have turned, been turned into, in a big anthropological sense, mainly the means of reproduction, mm -hmm. and restricted, put on a pedestal as a, um, Black suffragists said to her white suffragist sisters, a pedestal is as much a prison as any other small space. <laughs> and also uh, then for the sake of racial or caste or class purity, they've been separated. And the uh, other, the less um, socially uh, desirable women uh, are exploited as a means of reproduction for, che for cheap labor, for, for workers and, and so on. And this has s s separated um, the, the questions of sexuality and, re and, and reproduction and made, put some women in charge of sexuality and other women in charge of reproduction, if you see what I mean, when in fact that sexual, that deprives some women of their sexuality and other women of their freedom in their bodies and so on. But we all have common cause in, in uh, bringing back the control of ourselves, our reproduction and our sexuality to, to our, our own bodies. I, I think we, I fear that we sometimes get uh, into the current hierarchical way of thinking by arguing about what policy is good from above. You know, what, what generality is going to work down here? Actually, no generality is going to work <laughs> for everything down here. It's just it's very, very, very uh, diverse. Um, so I hope that our actions are not inhibited by uh, waiting for a solution 
up there, in fact. And the question of free will and, you know, is, uh, are we using our bodies in whatever way it is for free will, out of our free will, is also very, uh, is something we have to listen to each woman and groups of women about. If uh, we say that at the age of 18, then it becomes not child sex trafficking, what do we do about the woman who, and as we know, the average age of entry into prostitution in this country is between 12 and 13. And in many other countries, it's about nine or 10. So does she suddenly acquire free will at the, <laughs> at the age of 18? Mm -hmm. Now, I think we've begun to look at situations where this, you might call the statute of limitations is extended. For instance, when someone has been sexually abused as in childhood then we understand that the usual statute of limitations can't work in the same way. We, it's from the time that that uh, person, male or female, remembers it. And then we, we, we need that kind of subtlety in looking at the, the, the question of, of uh, what is free will. Do, do we have the right to, um, use our bodies in any way we wish, absolutely. Uh, but is, um, it, to what extent <laughs> is, it, is it free will when we are actually looking at a, a particular situation? So, you know, I think that the, what's very helpful uh, to me, speaking for myself, uh, about the so-called Nordic uh, solution, or the, what I think of as the third way, is that it is more nuanced. I mean, we have spent our, a lot of time arguing about legalization versus criminalization, right? Well, it seems to, sometimes I think the whole world is divided into two kinds of people, those who think the world is divided into two kinds of people and those who don't. <laughs> and I think probably this division into two also comes from gender. You know, and we, you know, the old languages didn't even have gender, hello? You know, so we've gotten into this polarized legalization versus criminalization. Uh, and, you know, there are probably situations in which some version of something, you know, in each works. But because the Nordic example, the third way, is the most diverse and the most, or provides for treating uh, reality uh, more, and not putting it all into one package. And therefore, it obviously um, it sets out to give choices to the prostituted person, man, woman, or child, to provide them with choices, uh, to uh, penalize, not criminalize, I would say. It's not by any standard. Penalize the, the, um, the demand, the customer, so that at least that person gets to know what the global sex industry is and what, what damage is, is being done. Uh, and and to, to, it, it allows much more subtlety, and I think that's why we see it being adopted most recently by France, but by uh, many other countries too. It allows for more recognition of, of reality. Um, I think also, in addition to overgeneralizing, you know, and getting into the division of two, sometimes we demand purity from our friends and nothing from our adversaries. You know, we, we, we look at um, people who are in all goodwill uh, doing quite a good job of being helpful, and if they are not perfect, uh, then we blame them in, when we don't demand even simple humanity from the traffickers. Uh, and the people who are part of the problem. It's, it's way easier uh, to judge someone uh, with little power than someone with a lot of power or someone who's in proximity to us rather than someone who's, who's very far away. So um, I hope that we um, support um, what is positive and worry less about criticizing what's not working. Uh, it, it's, 
And most of all, I hope we listen to each other. You know, there's nothing more important <laughs> than, than listening to each other. Uh, I think one of the simplest paths to revolution that I know of is for people who have less power, um, or if, it, if you're in a particular situation and someone has, usually has more power than the others, listen as much as you talk. If you have more power, usually talk as much as you listen, which is not that easy because we're used to hiding if we've had mm -hmm. less power. <laughs> so I think the, um, while understanding that we are, <coughs> a, we are uh, dealing with something that is fundamental to every government, to the human race, to our relationships and our families, uh, to the way we raise our children, that is mega, it's also deeply personal and reflected in the way we act every day. It's perhaps, uh, you know, I think Marx and Engels were very nice guys, but I think they made one <laughs> error, which was to think that the ends justify the means. Uh, I think actually the means are the ends. So I hope that if we don't worry too much about what we should do, but do whatever we can and make what we do reflect the ends we want, that we will all get there together and we will truly be in a circle and we will help to broadcast the voices of so many people for whom all of you are speaking and you know and you, the realities that you know that cannot be in this room at this moment, but that we will help to empower, to find voices and not to be objects sold in a global trade, but to be the unique individual, valuable, in human beings that each one of us is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria. I cannot tell you how much it means to all the women and, and men in this audience that you were able to come here today on such a busy time. It means the world to all of us. Thank you. Um, and now we come to Christina Gayak, the dynamic UN Undersecretary General for Communications and Public Information, who will deliver special remarks. USG Gayak came to the UN with over 15 years of experience as a journalist. Um, as well as uh, distinguished uh, service in government. She has done an outstanding job in helping UN agencies such as UNODC extend our outreach to the creative community. We are grateful to her and her team for their invaluable leadership in our joint efforts to combat human trafficking, especially trafficking of women and girls. She has also been a great source of encouragement to myself and other women in the UN, and we are all grateful to her for being there to encourage us. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. It's true, the microphone seemed to be working a little bit lousy today. Anyway, thank you, Simone. Thank you very much, Gloria, for your words. I think your thoughts are going to be with us. Already, your thoughts in your books were with us, but now that you express them so candidly and so well, uh, we really thank you for being here and for inspiring us. And I have a special thanks for Rachel, for Samia, and for T. Ortiz, uh, Petit Griot. The fact that they are joining us here tells us so much of the importance of endurance, and we pay our highest respect to you, and we thank you uh, also. My dear ambassadors, uh, the ambassador of um, uh, Hungary and Panama, they are great colleagues, and they are such a supporters of 
the good UN agenda. So we also want to pay tribute to them. And of course, uh, I want to pay tribute to um, uh, Rashida's uh, book, because it's the reason that we are here, and in particular to her, to her work. You know, the issue we are dealing is tremendous. Millions of people have been trafficked all over the world, and no country is immune. And this is a multi-billion industry. And according to your agency statistics, which are extraordinarily painful to read, women and girls account for 70% of the trafficked victims overall. Women and girls also account for 97% of those trafficked for sexual exploitation. We have so much to do. And let me tell you, dear friends, we have some instruments now with us, long-term instruments, which is the new UN development agenda. If we look at it in a narrow way, we have at least a number of goals and targets, which I'm going to mention to you, that will allow us to work better and to work more efficiently. For example, goal 5.2 calls for the elimination of all forms of violence against women and girls, including trafficking and sexual and other types of exploitation. Goal 16.2 calls for the end of the abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence against torture of children. And goal 8.7 calls for the eradication of forced labor, including child labor and the use of child shoulders. We have the way ahead of us, and now we must act. Leaders of all the UN member states agreed on this agenda, and now we have to promote it and make them accountable, and all of us have to say to do what um, Gloria was saying to us, what can we do to implement this agenda? I've mentioned it in a narrow way, very specific obligations that we have, but the broad way is that this situation has to change and must change. On my side, the Department of Public Information will spare no efforts to promote this, uh, this agenda, to ensure that while promoting it, we become, all of us, accountable of it, and that things change on the ground so that what we have been reading in terms of statistics do change. Do change because they are unbearable. And now my final point is of gratitude to UNOCD for this uh, tremendously positive initiative, Artists United Against Human Trafficking. This is a way to make people aware and a way to make people responsible and a, may, a way to do what Gloria said, what we all can we do for that. So thanks for being here and um, it's a, a fantastic opportunity, the one we have in front of us to start changing on a daily basis for the global objective. Thank you very much. Thank you, USG Gayak. And some of the figures that you cite from UN Office on Drugs and Crime Global Report on Trafficking in Persons are, are quite startling. I'll give you one more startling figure. 41% um, of countries reported in our global report no convictions or fewer than 10 convictions for trafficking per year. Um, unconscionable. Impunity reigns. Um, why, do we have a why do we have a global report? Why? Because many of you sitting in this audience, Rushira, Taina, many of you that I see here today, fought for a global plan of action to combat human trafficking. Um, soon, the General Assembly will review, it will appraise that global plan of action. Um, and that will be in a high-level meeting that will take place in the first week of October 2017. 
Soon, the next President of General Assembly will appoint co-facilitators, will appoint two ambassadors to review what have we done since 2010 to implement that global plan of action that applies to sex trafficking, that applies to trafficking in humanitarian and conflict bases. Um, we haven't done much. We have a trust fund. We have a report. We have some better coordination within the UN. We have some better awareness. but. We still have survivors on the ground who are not getting any assistance. So I hope one of the concrete things you can do, besides buying Rushira's book and sharing it with others, buy it for others. Many of you are we're preaching to the converted. We know that. Recruit others to our cause. Um, another thing you can do is make sure that this appraisal of the Global Plan of Action has the same periodi periodicity, has the same outcome document that we do for things like the counterterrorism strategy, that we do for the global program on youth, so that it is serious and all of us who work so hard to get that plan adopted, um, we're not doing it for naught. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce the intrepid Rushira Gupta. I first met Rushira Gupta 10 years ago when we were um, discussing, UNODC was discussing with the Security Council the possibility of having the first ARIA for, formula on human trafficking. And for those of you who are not from the UN, an ARIA formula is like an informal Security Council meeting where you can talk with civil society and UN agencies about an issue of particular concern without it rising to the full level of a Security Council meeting. Thanks to the work of many of you here today, under the leadership of Ambassador Power, the U.S. mission in December of last year actually had a full Security Council meeting on trafficking. Um, and UNODC is presently working on the report that has been requested of the Secretary General to look at what we are doing currently and what we can do better in the future about human trafficking. That report should come out in the fall. Um, so Rashira has been a great advisor to us on all of these initiatives, a great partner in Artists United Against Human Trafficking. Um, she's worked on handbooks that have taught us how to provide better technical assistance on the ground. Through Apne App, she has um, helped more than 20,000 girls, women, and their family members exit sex trafficking, bravely venturing into areas no one else could or would go. She testified to the U.S. Senate for the passage of the first U.S. Trafficking Victim Protection Act and advocated for the first uh, and advocated for the U.N. Voluntary Trust Fund for Victims of Trafficking in Persons, especially women and children. She has won an Emmy for her journalism, the Clinton Global Citizen Award, and the UN NGO CSW Women of Distinction Award. She's also author of As If Women Matter, the essential Gloria Steinem reader. She's um, the author. I'm the editor. Editor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I stand corrected. Um, and uh, one thing that Rushira has, has helped us with is, is make the concept of trafficking understood. As you know, in Article 3A of the Palermo Protocol, the UN Protocol to Prevent, Suppress, and Punish Trafficking in Persons, especially Women and Children, we have now for over 10 years a comprehensive definition of what human trafficking is, so we don't have to debate that anymore, thank God. And that involves sexual exploitation, uh, forced prostitution, slavery, servitude, slave-like practices, forced labor, and trafficking for the purpose of organ removal. And uh, Rushira has been instrumental in making sure that all forms of human trafficking are understood um, well and uh, in, in addition to sex trafficking. Um, oftentimes we find that women who are trafficked for some of the other purposes initially um, are, are double victims because it is rare that a woman who is trafficked for forced labor or some other type of trafficking purpose is not also sexually violated or traded. Rashira, you have the floor. Thank you, Simone, and thank you, uh, UNODC, Yuping, who's sitting behind me quietly, and so many friends and supporters who are sitting in the room today, besides the ones on the panel. I can see right in front of me Dorchin and two Rachels, Jessica, Taina. Um, I can see Melina, uh, and I'm sure there are many more people who I can't see who are in the room who have created this movement over the years. Uh, I was just a journalist 20 years ago. And I was uh, g walking through the hills of Nepal when I came across uh, rows of villages with missing girls. 
And I began to look for the answer to that uh, phenomena, that how could so many girls be missing? And that answer changed my life, because I found that in my generation, in my lifetime, in my country, modern day slavery existed, and there was a smooth supply chain from these villages to the brothels of Bombay. And I ended up making a documentary on the subject, uh, won an Emmy, and then journalism felt too limiting, and I wanted to do something more went back to the first circle that Gloria was talking about circles. I went back to the first circle um, of women who had helped me make the documentary by telling their stories uh, in Bombay's brothels and showed them the Emmy and I said, what can we do? And they said, can't you help us? I said, I don't know how to help you uh, because I'm just a journalist. I know how to tell the story, but I'm not a social worker. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, I don't know what to do. So they said, but you know English, and you have access to money and networks, and through that you can help us. And I promised I would, and on that premise, Apne Aap was formed. Apne Aap means self-empowerment in Hindi, and it was based on two Gandhian principles. Uh, one was called Ahimsa, which is nonviolence, that we would practice nonviolence to ourselves and to the other, because prostituted women are victims of violence to women, but also the customers who buy them buy, violate something in themselves before they violate the women, and therefore they are more violent. And uh, the other premise was Antodaya. Antodaya means uplift of the last, and this is based on Gandhiji's notion that whenever we embark on any action, we must think of the weakest person we know and how that action can help the weakest, most marginalized person we know regain control of their destiny. And uh, so with that very ambitious idea of regaining control of the destiny of the weakest person we knew, in this case, the 13-year-old in a brothel, or sometimes a 19-year-old, 23-year-old woman in a brothel, we began Apne Aap, and started with a very modest uh, room in a brothel district in Bombay, a community classroom, hired a teacher and started putting teacher, girls into school, preparing them for schools and then negotiating in circles of women with the first 22 women in prostitution, going to the principal, begging, crying, pleading, and saying, these children are children too, and can you not admit these daughters? And uh, the principal relented because the circle is strong, and, uh, you know, fast forward now, uh, Apne Aap has moved from Bombay because the red light area there has shrunk. Other NGOs have come in. And uh, the first generation of women that we worked in, their daughters are now in colleges. Some have jobs. Uh, uh, the first 22 of them, the first 20. Uh, you know, most of them have died. Only one is alive, and she too has AIDS. But their dreams live on in their children. And Apne Aap has helped more than 20,000 girls, women, and I must mention, and their family members. Because what we try to do is deep community engagement and start from the bottom and hope to transform the top by listening to the women sitting in circles. And the women and girls often tell us they cannot sustain the change if their family lives also don't change. And so we've been trying to do that slowly slowly, slowly, and in a very sustained way, many losses, many failures, and still continuing. And today, uh, I'm here to share with you one more political tool that we've created besides the voices of women who are survivors, who are prostituted, who are sitting in this room today, and the circle has, of course, grown bigger from the first 22 women in prostitution that I described to you. Uh, Rachel is here, T is here, Samia, who I hope to get to know better, over the years is here, and you know it's just such an honor that the circle is growing, and I'm part of it. You know, I'm just just so happy, and uh, you know, at that time when we began work, we didn't even know we would achieve it. But we keep inventing different methods, and sometimes the women in brothels are so silent they cannot speak up. So I look for ways to remind us who that last most weakest, weakest person is. Because very often when we get caught in the corridors of power or when we begin to do po big policy initiatives, we forget and we don't know how to imagine the last person. It's very, very hard because we are so caught in you know, words, language, files, documents, and uh, we, we can't imagine the last person. So this book, River of Flesh, is an attempt that these stories written by 
modern Indian writers who try to find empathy and put themselves in the shoes of the prostituted woman and girl in India's brothels in Bombay, Calcutta, Delhi, Lahore, Karachi, uh, they w would make us understand what a woman goes through. In these stories, you will find that uh, there is a woman who suffers from insomnia because customer after customer keeps coming to her whenever he wants an occupational hazard we don't think of. There's another story in which a woman talks about the fact that she cannot stand the smell of her customer's feet. We never think of that, that what is the customer looking like? And the reason I did that was that very recently, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and a few other organizations have actually uh, you know, said that they wanted to legalize pimping and brothel keeping. And I am extremely worried that uh, they don't know what a woman or a girl goes through. And maybe we can build up public, public opinion to reach out to these organizations which say that they stand for the human rights of people, to stand by the human rights of this most marginalized girl and woman who has nothing but the law to protect her. And if pimping and brothel keeping is legalized, then those who exploit her will get away with impunity. So this is just one more attempt. And this large circle of people sitting here, uh, exactly what Simone said, that think about the fact that read the stories, share it with other people. Each story will definitely make people understand what goes on in a woman's life. And um, I'm so grateful to Gloria because she has been a source of inspiration to me and that she came in the middle of writing her own chapter and a hundred other things which are going on uh, that she's here because she taught me also that you know let's not think about what we can do. Many of you will feel the problem is like a tsunami. Three million prostituted women and girls in India, it's so poor, how can we do with it? How can we deal with it? Let's accept it as inevit inevitable and just tinker with reducing the harm. But what Gloria told me was that no, we have to think about the fact that, you know, we don't have to think what is the perfect thing we can do. We have to do what we can, and that will bring about change. And over the years, I've tested that truth, you know, because I was skeptical when Gloria said that to a group of slum women in Delhi a long time ago. And that truth works, because if you do what you can, here we are today, uh, from the time I made Selling of Innocence 20 years ago, we have a UN protocol, we have a US law, we have budget allocations for NGOs, we have survivor leaders like Rachel Moran, T, who's uh, ran a campaign called There's No Such Thing as a Child Prostitute. Samia, who's going to listen to them and understand what you can be to break the silence and what it does. So, you know, the circles are growing and there's a lot of hope. And I want to end by just mentioning that as you go through these stories and as you listen to all the panelists and in whatever walk of life you are, ambassadors, uh, teachers, doctors, lawyers, um, uh, NGO activists, civil society leaders, remember a story by Gandhi. A British reporter once asked him that, Mr. Gandhi, why do you always travel third class? And he said, because there is no fourth class. <laughs> and I want you to think of that 13-year-old as the last and think about that fourth class that you can travel, because that will make all the difference in any action, any policy you do. Thank you. Thank you, Rashira, and, and thank you for Apni App's very survivor-oriented perspective. Um, only one out of 100 survivors is ever rescued, and we owe it to at least those who are rescued to make sure that they have sustainable futures and not just provide short-term um, solutions, which are really not in the long-term solutions. Oftentimes, when we've interviewed survivors of human trafficking and we ask them, how long were you trafficked for, they'll say, well, are you asking about the first time or the second time? And that's something we need to avoid. Um, our, our next speaker is uh, T. Ortiz Walker, a survivor leader and trainer specializing in developing strategies to end child sex trafficking. She founded the Still Alive Initiative, which provides daily mentoring and counseling for victims and survivors, as well as trainings for governments and NGOs and victims of domestic sex trafficking. She has testified before the US House of Representatives on child sex trafficking and was selected by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2014. In 2011, she was named Woman of the Year by Glamour Magazine. 
It's such an honor to have you with us here today, and we look forward to learning more about you as a survivor leader and more about what we can do, because I think as, as hard as we are trying in the UN, there's a lot more we can learn to step up our efforts, and I hope today moves us a little bit further in that direction. You have the floor, T. Most definitely. Well, I can't say thank you enough for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much to UNODC themselves, APNIAP and Ruchira, I can't say enough, um, and Artists United Against Human Trafficking, specifically and most importantly, Roseanne, who has been a personal supporter of mine and, and has made like an angel to me. And lastly, I would really like to say thank you, Samia, because I also know what it means to be up here and to share your story and to be transparent with this. And you are really a hero to me because I, at the age of 26, couldn't imagine doing this at the age of 15 when I was in it and I was just out. So you are remarkable and you are braver than I could ever imagine. And we all have our hats off to you, baby girl. So, I mean, I can't say enough what this means to me personally. I come from Oakland, California. I'm a little girl from the hood, mixed Puerto Rican, and I never thought that my life would be the way it is. I mean, I'm sitting here on a panel with Gloria Steinem, the Gloria Steinem, and I can't say enough what it means to know who I was as a little girl who once felt like I just wanted to die and I no longer wanted to live, to be liberated and to be able to walk in the path behind someone so remarkable who has made such change. And for me to be able to distinguish myself not only as a professional who advocates on behalf of human rights and women and girls and, and people of color, but as, you know, a survivor to be able to distinguish myself, you have made that path so much easier. So I thank you for that. Um, this is so important to me. I mean, I can, I can go on and I can ramble, but this is so important because as I speak, there are multitudes of young people who in this very moment are suffering, that are being bought and sold on the streets, in brothels, you know, in the back of papers, in various ways. And so what this means is this is another chance for us to remember and reach out and make a change for those young people who are being affected in this moment right now as we sit in this room. You know, I think um, what a lot of people don't realize is people ask, you know, how does someone become vulnerable for sex trafficking? And everybody thinks it's this, you know, whole idea of like taken and you're just gonna get, you know, kidnapped and all that. Well, a lot of people don't realize that specifically for children, the vulnerabilities are some challenges that are somewhat simple challenges that everyday Americans face. Succumbing to environmental pressures, trusting the wrong people, having lack around clarity around places to go for help. You know, these all attribute to vulnerabilities of children and, and mostly overall for women and girls who are affected by sex trafficking and even young boys. Um, I think one of the most important things is that we use the term survivor as if, you know, I am separated or removed from you or you are separated and removed from me. I think the most important perspective and the most important thing is to rem remember is that we are all survivors. We have all been through some sort of oppression, discrimination. We have all been done unjustly in one way or another. And if we can find the, uh, the opportunity and the energy to invoke empathy and understanding and comprehension to a survivor of sex trafficking, rather than sympathy, we can make amazing strides. You know, um, again, I think it's, it's dealing with this humanistic perspective, seeing it as in how all of us, you know, have things that can make us vulnerable and also being able to share it with empathy rather than the lens of sympathy. This is something that crosses barriers, it co crosses international lines. It's something that's true in every country. You know, and I think that one thing that was so remarkable that you said, Gloria, today here was that it's easy to judge someone who has no power and what we need to do more is give these survivors power and that's essentially what I and many of us and everyone here is trying to do. You know, I think that I read Rashira's um, River of Flesh and it was so impactful to me because people don't realize how this all ties in and it's all the same. You know, I read a portion of The Last Customer and the story of hopelessness and confusion of that young person was just the same as a story of hopelessness and confusion as a girl in America, in India, in Bulgaria, in Hungary, you know, all of these different places. And so to be able to see it through that eyes and that this is all relative, you know, we understand that those who do this work needs to be intentional 
because this work is meaningful and impactful. So it's so important. We have to focus on demand. We understand that there's exploiters. We understand that this is an atrocity. We understand that this is happening to young girls. But if we don't focus on the root of demand, then we are not gonna make any change. So it's all about really addressing that root issue of supply and demand. I, separate from being a survivor, am a scholar in communications and feel that it's so important. And as Rachira mentioned, I actually was able to pen and author a petition that changed the um, Associated Press style guide from using the term child prostitute. I really believe that by changing the language, we can change the stereotypes and the uh, illusions of perspectives or false illusions and perspectives on these young people and you know, allow them to have more opportunities for growth and for people to see this what this is. We can't call the customers Johns. They're child rapists. You know, they, they are people who are, you know, molesting people. And so we have to call them how they are, you know, and these are not child prostitutes. By using the term child prostitute, it gives a negative connotation that these are willing participants. And I can tell you one thing. At 15, I was confused and I did not see my, my you know, victimization. And if you would have told me at 15, I'd have cussed you out and told you I, didn't, I wasn't a, a victim because I didn't know what that meant. I didn't see that because I literally was just trying to survive. So for us to encourage, you know, everyone in the field, people in society to use the proper right language, you know, it's so impactful. A place like this, a place like the UN that has such leadership, I very much as a survivor, as a professional in this field, encourage you to avoid using the term sex worker as I don't believe that is proper language. Nobody wants to be a sex worker and nobody says when I grow up, this is what I want to do. I think that there are so many tools that are necessary that are needed to address this issue that are rooted in prevention, addressing the proper resources. And you know, so often I hear trauma-informed care or survivor-led, but this needs to equal individual-centered responses. This needs to be not only for the victims, but also for the strengthening the families and their communities. Um, and strengthening relationships. I can't say it enough that relationships are such an essential core of the vulnerabilities and of the reasons why people are stuck in this situation. And so we have to really strengthen our opportunities for continuous relationships. You know, although this is a sad circumstance, you know, it is only, nobody's gonna be rescued. I'll be the first to tell you, didn't nobody rescue me, didn't nobody rescue her, and didn't nobody rescue Rachel. It was through, and I, I, I can definitely, you can check me if I'm wrong, but I think it's definitely through the opportunity of self-exploration activities, self-esteem building, opportunities to push yourself beyond comfortability and safe spaces. So much of what AFNIAP represents that whole idea of self-empowerment, you know, and we have to, as mentioned, there's the weakest person, and we have to give that weak and, weakest person the, the power to embody strength and resilience to overcome these issues. So I sit here today, not as a sad survivor, not to tell you my life sucks and it's a sad story. I struggle, this hurts, and when I leave, I'm gonna cry. This is not easy to be as transparent as possible. But I am example by reminder to the resilience, transformation, and possibilities of this population to contribute to the future society. This includes leaders of the United Nations. This includes those of us who are gonna make change in healthcare and all other fields. This is, includes the next president of the United States and more glorious signings down the way. So I really wanna leave us with a quote that is literally the only reason why I'm here. It's a quote by F. Scott Fitzgerald, and it goes like this. The test of first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still have the ability to function. One should, for example, see that things are hopeless and yet be determined to make them otherwise. This is the group, thank you so much. Some of us in the UN can take some communication skill training from TRTs, I think. Um, we started off our, um, right, we were going to our readings right now, so we thought we would also come back after the readings to some more survivors. Um, but first we're going to go to, 
to our first reading, we have the honor of um, the actress, director Rosanna Arquette, an anti-sex trafficking advocate and supporter of Apne App. She has appeared in over 70 films. You all know the films that she's been in. Um, but as a director, it, I, I really commend you all to see her film, Searching for Deborah Winger. Um, outstanding expose of what it's like to be an uh, actress in, in Hollywood. Um, okay, one can say, well, I should wish I had such problems, but until there's gender equality in every aspect of our work, we are not gonna get where we need to, to be. The culture, the attitudes, the um, wage differences, the exploitation of women in that and other industries is, is endemic. And um, to have the courage to make a film like that, I'm sure it wasn't easy. Um, but it was fantastic, and I enjoy that film very much, and I hope all of you get it on Amazon or Netflix or wherever you can find films these days. Um, in addition to all her films, I, I also still to this day remember her performance in The Executioner's Song, um, which is something that was really a mind-blowing film that she did. Um, she's directed other films as well. I won't go into all of her um, credits, but a few of them I'll just mention. Um, Pulp Fiction, Baby It's You, Crash, The Big Blue, Buffalo 66, and Martin Scorsese's After Hours and New York Stories. It's such an honor to have you with us in, in the UN, and thank you for being such a, a strong leader in Hollywood. Thank you so much. Before I read, I, I want to say it's such an honor to be here and dress you all at the in United Nations today. And, and I want to thank Rashira and APNEAP and the UNODC for organizing a unique event to amplify the voices of survivors of sex trafficking and the survivors in the room whose testimonies bear witness to this great crime that has escalated to the scale of a tsunami. I also want to pay tribute to Gloria Steinem one of my true heroes in life. She has created a movement that has touched women's souls forever. In Los Angeles, where I live, you can buy a 10-year-old for lunch. In Los Angeles. I have met women survivors like T or Tiz who was sold at the age of four for a bag of heroin and sold for sex for many, many years living in the foster care system here in America. Billions of dollars are being made by the sex industry. It's big business. The profits are staggering. The advertisement is mainstream. It's so mainstream, in fact, uh, a commercial for Anastasia.com popped up while I happened to be watching the Republican debates. Just wanted to see what they had to say. <laughs> It played a few times, your own European ex, uh, escort. Really, are you kidding me? This is a commercial for prostitution during the debates for the presidency. What is going on? But it doesn't stop there. Girls are sold in hotel rooms, conventions, sports, film festivals. Pimps find young flesh on social media. I beg the leaders of our world to help prosecute pimps and protect children. We can't look the other way anymore. I met Rashira a few weeks, uh, years ago, a <laughs> years ago, and we <clears throat> immediately connected on many levels, and I'm so grateful for our friendship. Her incredible work as an advocate against sexual slavery for the most marginalized girls and women in the brothels. Brothels of India has inspired me. A, a breast cancer survivor, um, a visiting professor at NYU, a founder of a grassroots anti-trafficking organization in India, Apni App, helping thousands of girls and women trapped in prostitution. Uh, she's a writer and a journalist. Nothing stops Rashira from getting her message out to the world. Some of the girls she helps are as young as seven years old. They are brutally raped countless times a day by customers who want very young girls. Her dream is to stop sex trafficking and to create a world in which no woman is bought and no woman is sold, or a child, or a boy. 
This epidemic, this crime is so horrific, it requires a true storyteller to come close to capturing the impact. And so I'm going to read from uh, Ruchira's book, Rivers of Flesh. Um, this is called The Last Customer by Niranjana. The rain became heavy and there were no customers at sight. Slowly, her earnings dwindled. Connie grew frail and weak. She started walking up to people and seeking them out. Her cheeks dropped and her eyes grew vacant and dark. A fever was rising in her. She adorned herself more intensely to fight it off. From a distance, with her woolen coat and flowers in her hair, she looked just about bearable. But if one were to see her up close, her eyes looked like they were dancing, like ghosts. Some louts would come over to the school where she slept at night, but would not give her a paisa in return. She would pick a fight with them, but they would pester her endlessly and rape her. Their rapacious laughs and beastly howls would make Connie shudder. When her protests, press, protests became pointless, she would reign, resign in her, her fate and submit to them. Her fever increased. She felt a voice within her telling her not to take those baths at the lake. Before long, her skin was afflicted with a strange disease. The young Connie suffered. Her body began giving off a foul odor. Connie changed her shelter. She walked towards a run-down hut a furlong away. There, a middle-aged beggar had built for himself his own palace. He fed her some gruel for three days. She gaped at the sky through the holes in the thatched roof as she fell asleep. On the fourth day, the fever appeared to subside. She sat up. The beggar looked at her with desire. His face did not betray a trace of emotion. She had become incapable of experiencing emotions a long time ago. He skipped his begging rounds for the day and stayed back with her. His diseased body seemed to be making good on all the desire it had missed out on. In the evening, with her black overcoat upon her, Connie walked past the field and stood by its edge where it was dark. She was feeling faint. The piece of land they once tilled, her mother, her father, the stumped armed lover, all of them walked past in a procession in her mind's eye. The brother who had left to become a coolie in Madras and the one who had left home in a fit of anger seemed to her to be hailing her from a distance. She was filled with grief. Unable to stand for long, she collapsed upon the ground. In the distance, the ground nut hawker's kerosene lamp glimmered and called out to her. But she did not have even a paisa. She wanted to snatch fistfuls of ground nuts and gobble them up, but she did not have the strength for it. It was one in the night. Before long, it turned half past. Everyone who was strolling near the fountain left for their homes. Connie looked at each one of them with beseeching eyes. A man stood there alone. He was heavily built and had a wicked glint in his eyes. He gestured to her with his hands. Connie stood up with great effort and pulled himself, herself behind him. He seemed to be new to this. He pinned her just by the side of the shrubs. Connie tripped and a guttural sound escaped her. This irritated the man. He was quickly on his feet, brushing himself. He spat at her with scorn. Connie tried to sit up, but she had no energy left. He spat at her again and left without paying. Connie opened her mouth as if to wail loudly, but no sound emerged. She tried to stand up again, but could not manage it. He was walking away with quick strides. Finally, she managed to find her feet. She chased him like a mother would chase a villain stealing her child. She wailed in her hoarse voice and kicked up a fuss. 
He was running away without paying her. She was beseeching him with her babble to not deceive her. She was crying out to him, saying, Do not cheat me of tomorrow's meal. He looked back at her with dread. Some people were still around. What if they heard? What if someone came up and tapped him on the shoulder and asked him to explain himself? He stopped abruptly and returned. Clutching her throat, he pushed her to the ground and swore at her. Dirty bitch. He kicked her in the stomach. Connie collapsed in an instant. There were growls in her throat, and they were not audible. They were still, there was still some breathing, slow first and then rare. Her final breaths were more labored. Everyone was on the move. No one had time to stop. Someone said the municipal van would come by to pick up the corpse. Up above in the skies, a vulture circled and spiraled down. Connie laid with her eyes open as if keenly eyeing it. The vulture was slowly closing to a light upon her, the last customer. Thank you, dear Rosanna. We now move to our next reading with Her Excellency Ambassador Katalin Bogey, who has been one of, who is the permanent representative of Hungary to the United Nations, and before that had a long distinguished career as a journalist. She understands, as we all do, publicity is the very soul of justice, and she has been prioritizing this issue within her, the work of her mission here at the UN. Um, she will be reading from the short story by Kamala Das entitled A Doll for the Child Prostitute. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Before I read, let me thank you for inviting me to this very distinguished panel. It is a very moving and inspiring afternoon, I think, for all of us. There are global scenes and there are global uh, actions, what we have to do here to tackle these things in the UN. I think that is why we are so committed towards uh, where, oh, I'm sorry, you are leaving. Yeah, it's, it was wonderful You're to not see you. To yeah, but I, 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 I cannot not notice it. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, thank you. So, what I was saying that I really believe that there are global things and we have to tackle them globally. Hungary is totally committed um, in this fight against modern slavery, human trafficking. Uh, the fight against sexual slavery. We started to work with other member states on that because you can't do it on yourself. We've been very happy working with Liechtenstein, with the United States, with the Holy See, with a group of friends. Uh, we are very happy to be included and invited by UNODC. Thank you very much, Simona. And I think this is a job for all of us working with the uh, Secretariat, with the uh, Under Secretary General, and all the member states. Uh, otherwise, we cannot be successful. Uh, we think that we have to raise the awareness. I am a long supporter of culture diplomacy because I believe that the book we read, the music we hear, the fine art piece we look at touches our soul. And when we read these stories, they touch our soul. And we know more about this problem than from many political speeches. So thank you very much for this wonderful book. And I will read um, from the novel by Kamala Das, A Doll for the Child Prostitute. It was the same old story. The stepfather was raping the minor girl while her mother was out visiting her relatives. The fat woman called Ai by the inmates of the house threw back her head and laughed aloud, displaying two rows of brown teeth like rusty nails. 
Anna Suya, stop worrying about this nice looking girl of yours. She will be all right here. You will hardly recognize her after a couple of months. What she needs is good food. Look at my girls, Anna Suya. Do you see any of them looking unhealthy? I feed them eggs with their paratas in the morning. The little girl looked around. There were seven young women seated on the floor and all of them did look healthy. Rukmani, come closer to me, said I, drawing the child to her swollen bosom. Take leave of your poor mother. She has a long way to go and it's already late. The child, Rukmani, looked at her mother with dry eyes. She was not unhappy about leaving her home. The man who had moved into her home some months ago after her father had disappeared was a monster. He not only beat up her mother every night, but squeezed her own little breast, hurting her dreadfully when she was alone in the house. And last week, he had pierced her body until she bled all over the floor. You ought not to have sent away the good man I married you of to, Anasuya, said I. He was a steady fellow, and he never drank, but you lost it for a younger one. Are you satisfied now? Do not taunt me so, I pleaded Anasuya. I have been a sinner, but please, look after my child. She is innocent. Anasuya rolled the dirty currency notes in spa inside the paper and tuckered the roll into their waist. I would not have taken any money from you, I, she said, a sob rising in her throat. But we are practically starving at home. The baby is given nothing but tea and maybe a banana at noon. When she left the place, and walked towards the bus stop, the child Rukmani watched her, leaning against the bars of the porch. Finally, when her mother resembled a tiny green spot and dissolved with the other colors in the distance, she turned back to look at her new mother. Sita, another inmate of the house, dragged Rukmani into the corridor of the house, which was dark and had a steamy smell. Then she was taken to a hall where young women were sleeping on reed mats. One of them was wearing only a short skirt, which had slipped up to reveal the cheeks of her buttocks. Rukmani looked away in disgust. Oh, this one, she is utterly shameless. She is Radha, Sita said. She has a bad temper. Don't be, be careful with him. Uh, Sita pointed to a mat in the corner of the hall. That is where I sleep in the day, she said. You may share that mat with me. I cannot sleep in the day, said Rukmani. Sita laughed loudly and held on to her stomach as though it was about to burst. You are a baby. You are so innocent. Do you think we can sleep at night in this house? We shall all be very busy entertaining the visitors. Visitors at night? Asked Rukmani. Who will come at night? Sita could not control her laughter. Oh, she laughed. You are too funny. You will make me peace in my skirt. Rukmani kept her satchel of books on the mat meant for her and Sita. Men come to do things here, said Sita. What things, asked Rukmani. She was thinking of her stepfather and the pain she had experienced when he climbed atop her on the floor. You will find out soon enough, said Sita. Obey them or A will starve you to death. Do whatever they want you to do.
Thank you so much, dear Ambassador. Uh, our next extraordinary woman reading from River of Flesh is Her Excellency Ambassador Laura Flores, permanent representative of Panama to the UN and a member of the group of Friends of UNODC. So there's no excuse for not remembering that she was on the panel. My apologies, a senior moment. Prior to her present position, she held several distinguished posts in her government and also senior positions in UNFPA and the World Wildlife Fund. Um, she will be reading an excerpt from Kamala Das's A Doll for the Child Prostitute, another excerpt, so you hear more about that story. Excellency, you have the floor. The inspector Saheb was very gentle with the young girl. Do you want me to buy you a doll that opens and closes its eyes? He asked her, fondling her chubby arms. Yes, said Rugmani. There is such a doll in a shop at Churchgate, said the man. It cries, Mommy when you press it on its stomach. It is a foreign doll. It costs about 100 rupees. But I do not mind spending the money on you if you're kind to me off and on. I love you more than I love anyone else in this world. What about your wife and children, asked the child. I do not love them the way I love you, Rugmani, he said. I have a granddaughter of your age, but even her I cannot love the way I love you. I will get you toys every month if you promise to remain kind to me. I'm not good looking like that student who carried Mira away, but I have a soft heart inside me. I'm ugly. I'm like a monkey, am I not? Do you feel an urge to laugh at me when you see my face? Rugmani felt moved by the man's humility. You are not ugly, she said. You're a little bit like my father who left us when and went away. Whenever I see you, I remember him. You will never be unhappy again in your life, my darling, cried the inspector. I shall protect you. I shall ask Lakme by to keep you away from all clients except myself. You can be my keep. I shall, I shall pay her a fixed sum of money so that she will not complain. Will you like that arrangement? But what will happen when some young man comes forward and asks me to marry him, asked the girl. I shall be that young man, my Mogra flower, whispered the man hoarsely, holding her tight. Rugmani felt a slight nausea when she was assailed by the moldy smell of his scalp, where white hair grew in untidy patches. But she closed her eyes immediately and lay passive, thinking of the foreign doll that cost a hundred rupees. It is such an honor to share this panel. Thank you, Simona. Thank you, Anodisi. Such outstanding women sharing your stories, your work, your contribu contributions, your power, and your resilience. So many of us in this room, everybody here, men and women, committed to raising awareness on the millions of vulnerable women, children, and men that are victims of sexual labor and child exploitation or organ trafficking, among others. The stories told in the readings we're sharing and from the survivors in this room enable us to come face to face with, with one of the cruelest realities in our society. They allow us to empathize with the women and girls victims of human trafficking, girls like Rukmani whose lives and dreams have been stolen. Human trafficking is a social scourge that requires due attention from the international community for its complete eradication. It constitutes one of the most disturbing criminal acts today as it violates people's human rights and degrades their dignity. In 2012, Panama passed legislation to penalize human trafficking and formulated a national plan to combat trafficking in persons under which we have been making progress on five main pillars, awareness raising and prevention, protection and care for victims, prosecution of crime, international cooperation, and tracking and monitoring. All of them key elements in the fight against human trafficking. In line with our commitment to counter this social problem, Panama also joined in 2014 the Blue Heart Campaign Against Human Trafficking, an international initiative of awareness raising in the fight against human trafficking and on understanding its broader impact on society. Today, I'm honored on behalf of my country, Panama, to join this call for action so that we may put an end to this horrendous crime, eliminate impunity, raise awareness, educate our populations, and give hope back to the Rumanis among us so that they can rise to their full potential. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, we only have the room until 2.50 by special dispensation from the Security Council. So we're going to hear from Rish Machetti, the wonderful actress of, st of screen and stage. Um, and then we're going to go to two of the survivors from the floor to have the last word. Also, the group of Friends United Against Human Trafficking wanted to make a statement. So if everybody goes fast, hopefully we can get to them as well. So you have the floor. Sorry for rushing you. to share her grief and lessen it. She wanted to say, the child is ill. I got a telegram, I don't have a paisa. But she was instantly on her guard. She killed that cry for human sympathy. It would have made the ready customer flee and she would not be able to see her child. She gathered her skills together. She stood up, she blushed, began to demure, then stammered with a coy smile. I was not to be touched. A customer loses his wisdom when he hears something like that. He does not haggle over money, but takes a woman at her price. This she knew, that is why she lied. And a dagger plunged into her heart. Oh really, he said, five rupees. She said, hiking the price of her body when she thought he'd become reckless, five. She was going to entice a few customers at five rupees apiece and catch the night train to the village. To arouse him further, she began to playfully extract a five rupee note from his pocket. She pretended coyness, blushed, and said softly, you're the first one, the first after the year. It was part of her role as the timid newcomer to the business to not get up but she genuinely had no strength to do so. Stand up, he urged her again. She shook her head. He kept on insisting, she kept on refusing. He loved this stubborn, bashful bride. He stuffed a two rupee note in her hand and thrusting his hands under her armpits, hauled her up, urgently insisting, fobbing off her refusals, putting money in her hand as he went. He undressed her, garment, by garment. When there was not a stitch on her, her fist was bulging with money. After that, he did with her all that he wished. With every act, he gave her money. She began to feel the effect of Haji Malang Baba's powers. She accepted the money with devotion. She told herself her body was a stone and endured unspeakable horrors. She now had enough money to take her to the village and back and pay for medications and liquor. She gave up her entire body to his perverted lust. Her strength ebbed away. Her endurance left her at zero. She lost consciousness. Her fist, which had been locked tight, loosened. The wad of notes in it fell down. Suddenly she came awake as though scorched by fire. The drowsiness flew out of her eyes. She raised her hand and looked at her fist. It was empty. Still in bed, she trailed her hand feverishly on the ground, but it touched nothing. Her eyes went to the door. The man in the glasses was getting dressed. In a flash, she saw his cunning. She had borne unlimited horrors. Her endurance had ebbed, but now it was transformed into fury. It danced in her exhausted body like lightning. It consolidated the strength in her muscles, giving them power. Snake-like steeliness flashed in her eyes. Her face grew red and rage. Her upper lip rode up her nose and became a straight line. Somehow she pulled her sari around her and exploded like dynamite. You fucking pimp! Where do you think you're going, you bastard? Throw down my money first! For a moment, the sight of her altered face stunned him. But then he came to his senses and waited for Girija to reach him. When she lunged at him and squeezed her throat, he squeezed her throat and he pushed her away. Then he picked her by the scruff of her neck like a kitten and flung her down. She, a woman who had gone berserk with mother love, who had been on fire with grief, lay where she fell never to get up. 
The hand that had held her sari tight around her body grew rigid. The tongue that had shot up like a flame from the sacrificial fire was imprisoned behind the gates of her teeth. And yes, the restaurant owner who had explained the telegram to her had told her a lie. Her son had died. Yes, he had died. We're going to close with two survivor leaders' perspectives. The first being 15-year-old Samia Suleiman, who was a victim of sex trafficking by ISIL at the age of 13 for six months and 12 days. Samia, we're so honored to have you here. Please, we'd love to hear from you. Abid, I understand you will be translating for Samia. Um, I'm not sure if this is working. I, OK, good. My name is Samia Suleiman. I'm 15 years old. On August 3rd, 2014, ISIS attacked our area's Yazidi homeland, and they took me and my family uh, as hostages. We were not the only ones. They took thousands of Yazidis, uh, especially women and girls, and they enslaved them. They executed the men and they kept the women and, and kids and uh, young girls. They uh, separated me from my family, from my mother and my grandmother, and uh, I was 13 at the time, and they um, uh, took, uh, considered me uh, as spoils of war, and, and they sold us to each other, and they uh, raped me and other girls that were enslaved with me. They had a market for Yazidi girls as young as eight and seven years old were being sold between ISIS members and uh, they transferred them uh, uh, inside the ISIS territory. Uh, it's almost been two years and still uh, uh, over 3,000 Yazidi girls are still held by ISIS and they are being sold as we speak to each other. They sell them to each other and they give them to each other as gifts uh, in, in ISIS uh, uh, territory. More than 2,000 Yazidi girls have managed to escape with, on their own. Nobody has helped them to escape. And the ones that escaped, they live in, uh, in refugee camps in north of Iraq. And we have not seen uh, uh, any help uh, been, uh, uh, for these girls in these camps. Not only the, gr uh, the girls and women uh, suffered, but uh, we have discovered uh, 30 uh, mass graves in the, the areas that are being liberated from ISIS, and these mass graves are just sitting there, nobody has examined them, and nobody has taken any action. The ones that are in captivity, they're, they're, they are living in uh, horrible conditions. I've seen it, I've faced it for months, and uh, uh, the young boys are being trained in ISIS camps. Hundreds and, and thousands, perhaps, of Yazidi uh, uh, kids died. Uh, as, as a result of this ISIS attack on our areas. Uh, uh, only because my mother and uh, my grandmother resisted that I be separated from her, she was hit by a weapon uh, from an ISIS member, and uh, as a result of that, uh, after a few months, she died. 
اس رجاش وقت کم رجاش وقت کم سعده که وان کی چوچنی ازی بکنو اج وان دستی وان کافر خلاص نزونه درنگ. Sympathy will not help the Yazidi woman, but we 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 have not seen action being taken by the international community to help these women. حالی وان ازدی گلکی زحمت ال دستی وان کافر و زالم عادت طلب دین لکنن همه اختصاب کنن عائله همی جیکو دو قط کنن زاروی کچک جی قط کنن. They've separated families and they've forced. Many women to uh, horrible uh, conditions, and uh, they need help. They need real uh, action. The ones that have managed to escape they do really need uh, treatment. They do really need some help. Um, I, I urge the international community and uh, here at the UN to uh, take some steps in, and uh, uh, implement the genocide uh, that it was uh, committed against the Yazidis and um, help the Yazidis live in dignity and go back to their areas and, and provide some protection for them. Thank you so much for listening. And we have one more survivor leader that we will hear from before I make one quick announcement. Rachel Moran, we're honored to have you with us here today. The floor is yours. Is it okay, Dean? Okay, can, you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Okay. I just want to echo some of the remarks that were made earlier on about language and how we really need to get the language right here and how we will, in fact, get nothing else right until we do. Um, there are many different phrases I could identify. We don't have time, so I'm going to shut uh, what I'm saying down by, by a good way. Um, but I would like to talk about some of the phrases that came up even here today. Forced prostitution, for example. And I realize that that's embedded within the body of the law. It's an awful pity that it is, because of course what it does is suggest that there is um, prostitution of another kind. Um, Another phrase is sexual labor, which of course tells us that sex can in fact be labor. Well, sex is not work, it never has been, it never will be. So I think that we really need to look at, our, at the language that we're using and the phrases that we are in some cases codifying into law and realize the, the damage that we're um, unwittingly doing. So I'm gonna just read, um, while we're on the subject of language, um, a few paragraphs that I wrote for a book recently, um, which was a compilation of survivors' testimony and political views. And um, the title of the prologue that I was invited to write was The Dangerous Denialism of Sex Work Ideology. So I'm just going to read the last few paragraphs because we're, we're short for time. Um, we are consistently told that when framing prostitution legislation, we should consider those most directly affected by it. Indeed, we should. We should also make sure we are not duped about who they are. Those in the front line of the effects of prostitution legislation are not only those who are currently in prostitution. They are also those most vulnerable to it. Many children and adolescents who are currently living the hellish experience of broken homes, family dysfunction, violence and alcoholism, severe neglect and sexual abuse will have the future direction of their lives dictated by prostitution legislation. This is not only about those who are in prostitution, it is also about those who are currently being corralled into it. I have said that the first thing we humans do in any intolerable, inescapable situation is to erase our subjective reality. I believe I got out of prostitution relatively emotionally healthy because I did so little of that. The erasure of my subjective reality I did collude in was in the locus of a surface level pretense, enacted purposefully to protect me from the attitudes of other people. It was never for my own sake. In other words, I lied to others about what prostitution was. I did not lie to myself. 
If a subterfuge is consciously constructed, it is much easier to identify and therefore to deconstruct. My deepest compassion is with the women who must mine deeply within themselves to uncover that subterfuge, go through the pain of examining its shapes and edges and find a way to squarely look at the thing it was designed to conceal. In this process, they must acknowledge the carnage of their own complicity. The denialistic mentality of men who use women in prostitution has never been so utterly fed to bloating as it is by the ideology of the sex work lobby. There has perhaps never been an ideological framework in history that so thoroughly condones and emboldens the practice of oppression by the oppressed. It says simultaneously, continue to abuse us please and be at rest that there is no abuse going on here. Women who espouse this view owe it to every other woman to abandon it. They are traitors to their sex and to themselves. Women must cut through the sex work ideology, but they face confronting a reality that has been purposefully and aggressively hidden. So they must first acknowledge their own collusion with that concealment and abandon the psychological safety it affords. This is doubtlessly painful, but few things are so utterly necessary the sex work ideology must be deconstructed, and that starts at the individual level. The alternative is unthinkable for us all. Thank you. Okay. These are all various perspectives and, and nothing should be taboo to be discussed in the UN. And I, and I say to you, we all have different views on this and that's what the UN is for, to convene and discuss this and not shy away from these different views that we all have because in the end, our goal is all the same, to make sure that survivors like Samia, like TRTs, like Rachel, don't have to come here to the UN to tell these stories. It's not an easy thing. We salute them for their courage in doing so. We salute those of you in civil society for doing so. We thank Allison Adams of APNI App, Yu Ping Chan of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime for working tirelessly to make this event happen. Now the Security Council is going to really come after me and Rashira if we don't get out of here fast. So I ask that you all quickly go to the bookshop where we can continue this discussion in the visitor's entrance and do so with a swiftness. Thank you.